Welcome to this edition of One on One. I'm Howie Rose, and today we visit with one of the best relief pitchers the Mets ever had. His timing wasn't great because they weren't very good teams when he was there, but Skip Lockwood was a very important reliever to the New York Mets for several years in the mid and late 1970s. Skip, great to see you. Hi. How are you? I'm great. And Skip wrote a book not too long ago called Inside Pitch, which was a, a different sort of I wouldn't even call it sports biography. I might even call it sort of a whimsical look at life, not only through the prism of a baseball player, but just from someone with his antenna way up. What motivated you so many years after you stopped playing to write a book? There are a couple of things. Two things was I had a past tense career. I used to play. I was a Met. I was a Red Sox. And, and it bothered me to be referred to in the past tense all the time. So I figured if I write a book, I am an author and somebody would consider me in the present tense. And I've been out of the game since 1981, and that was important to me to have something still connected me to baseball in the present tense. I can't coach or manage, and I, I probably can't pitch either anymore, but the present tense gave me a connection to baseball that was very, very important. The second reason was people ask me, what was it like? What, what do they talk about out there? What happens in the dugout? What's the catcher come out and say to you? Now, I can't bring you with me. So I've, I wanted to write the book in, a, in the present tense so the people that read it could come out in the field and, and be with me and, and get in a uniform and put the hat on, and put a glove on, and, and be in the same, um, the same game that, that I played. I thought it was important to write it in such a way that it would transport people out to the game with me. Um, I believed in, motor, in visualization. I believed in preparation. When I was here, Tom Seaver was my best friend, also my ride to the ballpark. So I had to listen to Tom an hour longer than most people had to. Um, good guy. Um, very bright and very deep thinking. I'm going to ask you questions like, why do you pitch? Or do you throw the ball to the catcher or do you throw it beyond the catcher? What's going on? And you'd have to come up with answers. And so what I learned for Tom, from Tom, is that he wanted the same out of me as he gave. He wanted dedication. He wanted preparation. He wanted somebody that the game meant as much to me as it did to him. And, and he expected that when I pitched, everything that I would do would be because I prepared and I was ready and I would throw in the same enthusiasm as he did, and he pitched hard, as you know. He sure. pitched, he pitched, he was a craftsman. I wasn't a craftsman, but I could get it up there pretty good. So did you feel a different level of responsibility, if I that's did. even possible, following Tom on the yes, mound to try absolutely. to save one of his games as opposed to anybody else's? Well, not, it was different coming to the Mets because Tom put that expectation that when you took the mound, you had the expectation of 24 other players and a manager coach that you were going to play well. And when I took the mound in Milwaukee, it, was, it didn't seem the same. We were all just struggling, trying to hang on to a uniform, hang on to a contract. But in New York, it was the expectation of the team that they wanted to see me pitch. And, and that was great for me. I felt part of the team. I didn't feel like I had to wait four more days or five more days for a start. I was going to get a chance to pitch today. If it didn't do well, I'd get a chance to pitch tomorrow. So I felt included. Yeah, more than any place else. Baseball's momentum. It's one game feeds on another, feeds on another. You're seeing that here. You're seeing a lot of good games coming. The Mets are winning. They're starting to get momentum. That's what I felt. And interestingly, when you decided to write this book, you wrote it all by yourself. I did. You know, most former athletes or most broadcasters, a lot of people who are, you know, in any kind of a public eye who write a book generally have somebody ghosted for them. And they work with them, of course, and make sure it sounds like them. But uh, was that a, a difficult trick for you to pull off? No, I had stories and I had written stories over the years. And I, when you try to capture them all the same in the same structure, it was difficult to, to find out the bones of the book, as they would say. The stories came along, and some were past tense, some were present tense, some were fictionalized, some weren't. Um, I had all the stories I needed. So trying to bring it in, into form was the hardest part. It came to me, 
Mets 75, last game of the season. Seaver pitches, I close, he's Cy Young, I get to be closer. So that was the thing that, that made it happen. <clears throat> that was the, the reason it, it fit together. Writing it was a joy. I don't know whether you have done much writing, but the, when you start to type or when you start to think, names come to you, dates come to you, people come to you, you never even thought of. If you've got something to say, it's a catharsis too. It is. You know? it, it brings out, I, I found that when I was explaining things, it, it, it made me laugh. The stories made me giggle. I want you to tell a couple of them because okay. one of the early ones in the book is hilarious and it really takes you to the very formation of your professional career when uh, you coaxed a very difficult man into giving you $100,000 more than he was prepared to give you. Would you please tell us how you signed with the then Kansas City A's? Pat Friday was a general manager of the A's and I had been scouted pretty heavily for a couple of years in high school. As an infielder, As right? an infielder, right? With, with speed and a good arm. But I was, I hit pretty well in third base and I had an offer. So this was before the draft. So we had people coming in to make an offer to me and they'd all come in one at a time. So Charlie sent his, his general manager in and the general manager, Pat Friday, was, I think, the last guy. I think he gave my father a couple cigars so he could be the last one in. So he came in last. He said, you know, Skip, he said, what have you been offered? And I said, I've been offered $35,000. He said, I'll give you $35,000 too. And my father got up and he left the room because he wanted me to make the decision about whether I was going to sign or not. Because he was gone. And so I said, Pat, have you got a pen? He said, yeah, he just got a pen. And he pushes the contract over. So my name was Skip Lockwood on the contract, which isn't correct. My real name is Claude Lockwood. And I said, you know, I'd like to change one thing in here if I could, please. And he said, what is it? And I put a one in front of the 35, true story. And he blanched. You know, he, he, he didn't know what to do. And he said, well, I'm not authorized. And he gave me, I think he probably was, I'm not authorized to do that kind of money and everything. It's just for a rookie, for 130, nobody's making 135. I've got to call Charlie. So I said, okay, there's a green phone hanging over the dishwasher in the kitchen. And we were sitting at a little table about five feet away from it. And I pointed to it and I said, go ahead, make it short, though. It's going to be a collect call. <laughs> yeah. And he did. And, and they talked for a while. And, and Charlie said, I want to speak to him. So I, I never spoke to Charlie before. And he said, why should I give you that much money? He says, because I'll make you win. He said, put, put Friday back on the phone. I got it. The 35 got washed into a scholarship to college and stuff like that. I think he, Catfish got some money and Joe Rudy got some money. and Reggie got some money. Sal Bando got some money. So I, there was money to spend. I think he signed 70 young players that year looking for an athlete if he could, but he was trying to get the best talent he could find in the country. As, as you started your way through that farm system, did you have any sort of foresight about what was to come with the eventual Oakland A's doing what they did? No, I, I was lucky. Um, they gave me enough money so they kept me in uniform way past the, the <laughs> days they should have. I wasn't a very good hitter. And I, I could hit fastballs pretty good in the daytime, I wore contact lenses. I had these big Coke bottle glasses, and I wore contact lenses. Well, at nighttime, your eyes open wider, and the contact lenses gradually float down. When you, so I gradually looked up. And, and you can't hit if you're gradually looking up like that. And I just wasn't a good hitter. We played all night games in the minor leagues, and the contact lenses were those, those old plastic things that would float around your eye, you'd lose them. And, so I had to do some service time for the Army Reserves. I didn't wear any, any contacts at all. By the time that was over, I couldn't hit at all. By the, and so Charlie asked me if I wanted to pitch. And I said, yeah, do I stay in uniform? He said, yeah, you stay in uniform. So I greatly appreciated his patience with me and the ability to get back on the mind, to learn how to wind up and learn a little breaking ball. I could always throw hard. Well, I didn't have any idea where the home plate was. There's another story you tell in the book as we fast forward ahead to when you come to the Mets in 1975. And the Mets had an equipment manager back then by the name of Herb Norman. Herbie Norman. Who, I guess, took a pretty unique route 
towards introducing you to your new teammates. How did that work? Herbie was a prankster. And there was numerous stories about what Herbie has done to players and his, his pranks were, were, were very famous. I didn't know anything about him. I got to the ballpark late. He said, what are you doing here? Were you supposed to be here early? What are you so late? He said, get, your, get dressed, get going. So I hurried up and got the stirrups on and got everything, new belt and new hat and that the, the, the hat protector in it still. And he put a coat on me. They were playing Montreal all the time. So we were leaving rubber in the little go-kart. You know, old Shea Stadium had that passageway underneath that I didn't know which way we were going. So I got out to the bullpen. I guess I should have done my research to figure out what team we were playing. So I started to introduce myself to the bullpen. I was in the wrong bullpen. Those Montreal Expos uniforms oh, They were blue, a but a lot of them had them on. They had the caps <laughs> off. I would have known. <laughs> I guess I would have known. I don't yeah. know. I was so excited to be. So I was in the wrong bullpen, and Herbie had played a prank on me that I guess is still legendary. He, he, he loved to play pranks. So he, he was laughing. He could hardly contain himself. And <laughs> he brought me back to the, the bullpen. Joe Pignatano was in the bullpen waiting for me. He's on the phone. He said, yep, he's here. I said, oh, what? He said, they want you to warm up. Well, I didn't know whether he was pranking me now or what. I, you know, Welcome you, to New York, I don't baby. know. <laughs> I said, oh, OK. So I start to warm up. I always step on a, a zucchini. So there's a garden, evidently, in the, in the bullpen. <laughs> Who ever heard of a garden in a bullpen? So Big Natano says, watch out for the zucchini. They, they don't step back over there. <laughs> So anyway, I got in the game, and and um, Casey was the uh, Yo uh, yeah Casey Casey Stangle was the well Yogi was Yogi the manager was, not Casey Yogi yeah. was the manager, and I'd never met him. I didn't know anybody on the team, obviously, and so I went out to the, the you know he's waiting for me with the ball in his hand, so I didn't know whether I should shake hands with him. I figured that would make everybody nervous <laughs> in this stand. So I took the ball. And, and it dropped because I was so nervous. And Bad everything. omen right there. Bad omen. You never should drop the ball. So he says to me, he says, what's your name? <laughs> so I said, Skip. He said, OK, Chip, listen to me. He said, I want you to throw strikes and throw. So he started yelling from the dugout when he got back, come on, Chip, throw strikes, throw strikes. Well, he didn't really have much time to learn your name because he by the time you finished fired. pitching both ends of that doubleheader, he ended up getting fired because I think you guys got shut out something like 7 nothing in both games. I hope it wasn't my fault. I don't think I so. I don't think it was. So he brought you back in the second game, though. He did. And that's something you almost never... Well, first of all, you hardly see doubleheaders today anyhow. But we had one here not too long ago, and I asked the manager, do you plan on using either of two particular relievers in both games of the doubleheader if the situation presents itself, he said, oh, no, we would, I would never do that to them. I mean, that's the prevailing attitude about pitching now. Do you have differing thoughts about how pitchers were utilized in your day and how they could better be utilized today? Well, it's very, uh, everybody's got a job. So the closer, when, when, when I was closing for the Mets, Supposed to pitch with a lead. The lead could occur in the sixth inning, seventh inning, eighth or ninth. When we got a lead and it was under three runs, I would pitch. And a lot of times that was a couple innings. So you, I think this, you get a stronger arm the more you pitch. So I used to throw on the side even the days when I was going to pitch. So I developed strength and in, in elasticity in my arm that I feel like maybe today's pitcher doesn't have. In, in Seaver, Matt Lack and Kuzman were all on the starting pitchers with me. They all threw long. They would throw in the outfield before the, the game. Never did that before. I was just through 60 feet, six inches. So I got in the habit of loosening up before the game and throwing long. So for me, it was a privilege to get a chance to pitch as many times as I, I pitched. I always knew my role. If we got a, a lead in the seventh inning, I was going to pitch. And I wanted that. So it, it was expectations like we talked about now, before. If you pitched two, two and a third, two and two thirds, when would you next pitch? Tomorrow. There you go. But you want to bet. I was still loose from the day before. Um, I used to, the muscle secretes a lactic acid when you pitch. That's what makes you sore. But you can squeeze that out of your arm. So I had John, Joe Deere 
was our trainer, and McKenna was our trainer. And he used to, they used to squeeze that lactic acid out of my head. Well, I never got sore after the games. I always felt good when I'd come to the ballpark. And Joe Torrey, when he was the manager, would look at me and he'd go, and I'd say, yeah, yeah, I want to go. Now, we only have a couple of minutes left with Skip Lockwood, so let me just ask you off the top of your head about any particular memories that you had with the Mets, any teammates that you might have been other than Seaver particularly friendly with? I have a whole page that, that I thought we could talk about, and I, there's just so many, and, and um, we, we had such leadership on that ball club with Woody Buddy Harrelson and Eddie Cranepool and those guys. They all, they seemed to come from the area. They knew the town. They, they knew me. Everybody, Cranepool was a saint. I mean, he, he was a great leader. I mean, Seaver was obviously the best pitcher I'd ever seen, but, but the team absorbed me. They took me in. They found places for us to stay. They, they wanted me out there. They gave me a uniform. It was a privilege. Was it difficult to endure those couple of years after the Seaver trade when it was clear that the Mets were taking a step backward and it was going to be a few years before they could reasonably be expected to contend? You're at the prime of your career at that point. How difficult was, was it for you to stay on point with what the club was doing? June 15, 1977. Um, I was waiting to go to the ballpark because Seaver was my ride to the ballpark. Never showed up. We didn't have cell phones and I didn't know what was going on. And I tried to call him and he didn't answer the phone. So I found out when I got to the ballpark late that, that he had been traded. And I felt like there was a big change in the team. I felt like the balloons air had been taken out. Um, it was a big blow for us. I'm not sure what it meant for the city because I was, I was only in a city of 25 guys, but it meant a lot to us. I mean, we had good guys coming in with Zachary and, and, and Flynn and those other guys that came, all good players, but, but they weren't Tom Seaver. There weren't a lot of relievers in Mets history who were Skip Lockwood either, and we're so happy you spent Thank some you. time with us today. It's great so seeing you again, great Skip. Great to see you. Thank you. Thank you for everything. Skip Lockwood, our guest. I'm Howie Rose. We'll see you next time on One on One.